Hey everybody, how's it going? It's Tate and Lawrence from Nanjing Marketing Group. We're just about to check out this week's China news. Chinese culture, Chinese technology, Chinese marketing stuff. This is the kind of stuff that as marketing people in China, we want to follow so that we know what the trends are, what's going on, so that we know how the regular China Joe goes about his day and how he ends up making his purchases. We have six topics today. Uh, first, we're going to look at a couple updates about WeChat emojis. Then we have this new article about 11 tips for WeChat marketing for education, and we'll just cover two of them. Then something about uh, Chinese passenger jets, uh, something about Inner Mongolia and Bitcoin. Then we'll look at Tim Hortons opening up in China. And finally, we'll look at some kind of funny cultural misunderstanding here that has something to do with chamber pots. Okay, first one here. Uh, Lawrence, this news that I see is about um, these WeChat emojis, and it looks like they changed them a little bit So by removing the uh, cigars or cigarettes from their mouths. Is that right? I think uh, the reason they did this is back to probably 2017, um, the Beijing government, um, the Beijing cigarette uh, government issue that there are so many uh, smoking emojis on different platforms like WeChat, Weibo. And then uh, on the same year, um, uh, Weibo stopped the smoking emojis. Mm -hmm. And at 2021, uh, when we had the latest update on WeChat, all the emoji got, all the emoji turns to a GIF where you can actually post it. You can see it's moving. Yeah. And I think probably WeChat noticed a lot of young people are learning from that, or maybe this is just bad emojis. So they just changed that right. to non-smoking emojis. Okay. Well, the, in this other image, they got the guy having a little leaf in his mouth instead of a cigar. Um, mm -hmm. I think he doesn't look nearly as badass as he does with his cigar. I mean, that emoji has a lot of attitude when he's got the cigar in his mouth, don't you think? Yes, I like the old old emojis. It's so cool. Yeah. Um, and people smoke everywhere in China, but it's gotten to be a bit less. I mean, the last time I was there was the end of 2019. Anyways, mm -hmm. then people would smoke in restaurants. Usually that, that was still normal. And they might sometimes have some smoking sections and non-smoking sections in restaurants. Yep. And that's about as far as China got with non-smoking, as far as I was concerned, because I see people smoking everywhere. I mean, they smoke uh, in the train station, they smoke in the elevator, they smoke in the bathroom next to the office in Nanjing. <laughs> yes, that's true. I hate that. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, actually, from this post, this is actually goes very hot a few days ago on Weibo. And all the comments from netizens are saying, okay, this is actually a good move. They're mm -hmm. not saying it's bad. They're just making fun of it. They said, oh, this is a good move. Oh, I think I should stop quit smoking, etc. Yeah. So I think this is a good sign. The people, the young people or people who are surfing on Weibo, at least, are giving a positive feedback on this. But I yeah. don't know, for like majority of people, just like the people you mentioned, they, they're probably going to still smoking in the bathroom. Uh -huh. You can't really stop that. Yeah. All right, cool. Let's check out the next one. Sure. Okay, so we wrote up this article just recently about 11 ways to use WeChat for student recruitment in China. And anybody that wants to know that and wants to know everything in that article can go check the whole thing after. I thought I'd just bring up a couple of these and um, I'll give my opinion and you can let me know if you have any thoughts on it too, Lawrence. But... Um, I guess mm -hmm. the basics, the really basics about how to use WeChat for student recruitment is to first post some articles on it and just post them regularly like it's a newsletter. Okay, like it's mm -hmm. a blog. But do yep. them do them regularly and make sure that they are formatted nicely, beautifully, and that they have useful and entertaining content for people. I think this is actually pretty easy to understand for anybody, for anybody that does marketing. I mean, it's easy to get into this and get started because people will yep. follow you and then they'll just continue to read your articles from time to time. And then down the road, 
you'll get leads from them. Or in this case, for student recruitment, you'll get people asking more about the school or even um, applying at the school. Mm -hmm. And then for schools, another thing that they can do that's really easy is to just set up the account as a mini site. Because uh, this is, I'm sure that people that lived in China or that live in China now know what I'm talking about, but people that maybe haven't or are just considering uh, moving to China or considering marketing in China, they don't know this stuff. They don't know that WeChat has many sites in it. It's it's a lot like a website, uh, but very, very simple. I mean, you can set out these menus within your account and then people can click on the menus and they can click through to get to articles or videos or other content that you have. It's a really easy way to get started. If you're a school that is attracting Chinese students at all. Sorry, I'm talking uh -huh. sometimes to the people that are listening and sometimes to you, Lawrence, but I, I, I mean any schools that are doing any marketing in China or trying to attract students at all really should have a mini site on WeChat. It's one of the most basic things that they can do to get started, and it's really okay. helpful for people. Okay, I learned that. Any more tips from this? Yeah, one more, one more. I said two, but maybe it'll okay. be three. Uh, the other thing is to, to build an online community just by setting up some groups within WeChat because these groups are, you know, they're kind of like Telegram groups, actually. Mm -hmm. You don't use Telegram, do you, Lawrence? No. Uh, what do you mean by Telegram groups? Um, well, to explain it to listeners that haven't been to China, I, I compare it to Telegram because it's a little bit similar. It's just a simple kind of group that people would join on their mobile uh, device using a chat program like WeChat or like Telegram. And the way that we do these with students is we get the students and uh, the parents or agents or people that are just interested in the school to join in that group. Mm -hmm. And then they start chatting and they chat about okay. what they want to chat about, basically um, Sometimes people will come in and spam a bit, but if they spam, you just ban them. So that's that's okay. That keeps the spam down low. And it's easy marketing because they're doing it for you. They're just in their group talking with each other and learning. And uh, they believe each other more than they would believe any kind of advertising that would come out anyways. I mean, they want to hear from students. They want to hear from parents. They, they want to hear from alumni. They want to hear maybe what agents have to say, and that uh -huh. makes them more comfortable about going to a school. And then, of course, you can share your WeChat yeah. articles and whatever else you publish within the group too, moderate it a bit. Okay, uh, I have one question. Uh, is that possible for others who might have a friend want to join the group? Is that possible for them to add their friends into the chat, in the group chat? Hmm. Well, I think it depends on how it's set up mm -hmm. because some, I'm not a hundred percent sure on this. I think okay. they can add it or maybe they have to request permission from the group owner before the person gets added in. Okay. Okay. Uh, I remember that functions. I think before, uh, the, when the total number of people in a group below a hundred, mm. uh, they can share the QR code to just scan the code and join the group. But if over a hundred, then they might be uh, need some permission from the group owner. Okay. Yeah. With these uh, okay. educational groups for schools, mm -hmm. we, we don't get problems with lots of crazy people entering or anything. I mean, sometimes people okay. will come in and start spamming a bit, but then well, we just boot them out anyways. So it keeps things pretty orderly. Okay. So that's that for that topic. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave a URL at the bottom of our YouTube and podcast and stuff so people can check out that some more if they want sure. to. Next topic. All right. So these are about these jets. Um, yeah. Basically, China is producing these new jets so they can get in the market and they can have some of this market for themselves. Um, what it says here from subchina.com is... China's state-owned commercial plane, ma plane maker signed a contract to sell the country's first home-built large passenger plane, the C919, to China Eastern yeah. Airlines. So this um, 
Playmaker's not new, but they're making their first sales of this jet, which mm-hmm. is cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also the article says that the C919 shoulders China's ambition in civil aerospace and is expected to break foreign companies' duopoly in the large aircraft industry. Okay. So what we should see in this industry pretty soon is we'll have uh, three players. You know, we'll have Boeing and Airbus, and we'll have this uh, Chinese plane maker one. What did they say it's called? Colmac. It's called Colmac. The company called the Colmac. Colmac. So, but the, yes, it's C O M A C. So oh, the company oh, oh. name is called Colmac, but the plane called C919. So yeah. actually, I can share a little bit of fun fact for our audience. Maybe sure. they don't even know this. Yeah. So actually, C919 means uh, the C stands for Colmac. So that's the first letter of Colmac. And 9 stands for lasting forever. So Tian Chang Dijiu. So that's Chinese meaning, the lasting mm. forever. And the 19 means the first Chinese medium aircraft with 119 seat. So that's the C919. Mm, okay, cool. Next topic. So I think, uh, yeah, uh, so I think the C919 has the largest, uh, the, the most seat in all medium aircraft. So it has uh, 119 seat. Okay. Yeah. Okay, next topic here. This one's about uh, Bitcoin and Inner Mongolia. It's from yep. pingwest.com. And you sent me this article, Lawrence, but I'll, I'll just read out part yes. of it and then let, let me uh, listen to you. Uh, the yep. article here says that Bitcoin mining consumes an estimated 129 terawatt hour per year of energy. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that means, but it, it explains here. It says more than entire countries such as Ukraine and Argentina. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. Um, and China accounts for 65% of all Bitcoin mining globally. Mm-hmm. But China's central government is clamping down on energy consumption of cities as the country has pledged to control the rise in its carbon emissions before 2030. So mm-hmm. Inner Mongolia has not been conserving enough energy and they won't be allowing uh, Bitcoin mining projects there. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So I think back to um, 2018-19, uh, the government released a report that says uh, the government won't allow Bitcoin transfer. So they, they said not allowed, but that's not illegal. And I think a lot of server mining just moved to the west part of China where mm-hmm. it has less control and less government patrols. But now mm-hmm. I think that the government just simply realized that the, this is just too power consuming. And on the other hand, I think one thing I want to say is we recently say Bitcoin rises a lot. I think it rises to one Bitcoin worth to probably 50,000 US dollars. And China is also pushing for its digital currency. So I think this might probably have some mm. reason to, to go with digital currency. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I think, as this report says, the Chinese government is trying to control the power consuming by 2030. So that's still got nine years to go. And all of a sudden, it just shut down the, it's going to shut down all the inner Mongolia's mining. Right. But why didn't they do it early? I mean, they released the report in like 2017, 18. We got to wait for another three years. Mm-hmm. And luckily, recently, we see a lot of news about digital currency going on from cities to city. Yeah. I'm just amazed at how much energy that takes up. Um, that just keep running the, the, the GPUs. I know that a lot of yeah. people are buying uh, the GPUs, then just set up their mining and just open that for 24-7 nonstop mm-hmm. Yeah, but crazy. S- okay, so you're thinking that um, this is one of the things that the Chinese government is doing to put a damper on the cryptocurrency industry and that if, yep. that if that's the case we'll see more and more changes coming up especially as they release the um, DCEP the Chinese uh, government digital currency yes that's correct 
Cool. Next topic here. Uh, it looks like Tim Hortons is expanding more in China. I'm happy to see this yep. because I like Tim Hortons. Um, mm -hmm. Tim Hortons is, it's like an iconic Canadian brand. It's, it's not actually Canadian owned though. I think it's American owned, but it's operated in Canada and it's just everywhere in Canada. It's a kind of a old fashioned uh, coffee and donut and sandwich store. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, while Starbucks feels kind of fancy and high end, Tim Hortons is supposed to feel more like the old kind of corner coffee and donut store you might find in a, in a small town in Canada. Yeah. And the, the market in China for these kind of places is, is, is quite big. We've seen other place, other coffee providers in China, like Luckin just explode and just have mm -hmm. amazing growth and then completely, well, ha fall apart or have a lot of problems. But um, yeah. in China, this happens all the time. I mean, with coffee now, but before with tea and any kind of fancy drinks, uh, those kind of places can just become so popular and take off. Yeah. So actually, I, I have one question. So because I used to stay in Australia and I had coffee every day, every working day. And it reminds me that in Australia or maybe in Canada, the coffee is just so cheap. It's just equal to a bottle of water. Right. But in China, the coffee is actually very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, Besides Lucky Inn, I think either Starbucks or I haven't drank Tim Hortons before, but I think it's around 20 to 30 Chinese yuan or maybe more expensive. Right. And you can't really find the 20, 20, 20 Chinese yuan coffee in China now. So I think it's, it's still got the market, but it's just too expensive for normal Chinese users. Right. Yeah. To put that in perspective, uh, a bottle of water at a small store outside our office in Nanjing might cost, what, three yuan? I think two yuan. Most of them are two, two yuan. yuan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then a coffee from from Starbucks or Tim Hortons might cost 20 yuan or 25, 30. I think minimum is around 25 to 28. You don't mm -hmm. really see like 20 in Starbucks, at least 25 or 35, even 40. Yeah, I know. I Every, mean, everyone in the office teases me when I bring in the uh, um, tea from Starbucks. Mm hmm. Because I it's I spend like twenty yuan on it or something, and people are like, why, you know, why the hell would you buy that? Just like, can't you just is it like make some tea in buy the coffee. office? And my, yeah, and my answer is I don't know. I'm just addicted to Starbucks. I go there all the time in Canada, and then I come to China and I keep buying it. But anyways, um, I got a bit off track just talking about this. I, there's a couple points from the article I just want to make sure to mm -hmm. read out. Um, Tim Hortons got new funding. It, the funding came from. Sequoia, China, Eastern Bell Capital, mm -hmm. and Tencent. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and um, they just plan to open up 200 new offline stores in 2021 and then to mm -hmm. open up up to 1,500 cafes across the country in the next few years. So big plans there. I, I would like it if there was a bit of Canadian coffee culture in China when I get back there. Mm -hmm. I would hope that there will be more coffee shops from different places or regions because the more competitive they become, I think that they will just become cheaper for, mm. for us to buy the coffee. Mm, I hope that's something I can see in the future, maybe yeah. next quarter or next, yeah. next year. It should get cheaper. It's supposed to be cheap. Tim Hortons is supposed to be yeah. cheap in Canada. That's, that's part of their deal. Yeah, because in Australia, it reminds me, a bottle of water is around like three point three or four uh, dollars, yeah, and a, a cup of coffee is around four dollars. So that's actually the same. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our last topic of the day here. Um, yeah, this is just kind of a bit of a funny thing. There's this uh, expensive, well, not that expensive, but kind of expensive Chinese antique fruit basket sold on yep. Amazon, and on Amazon, they show it with some fruit or, or fake fruit on it, on it, sitting on a table. With some, it's a, women are just enjoying their time there, sipping some orange juice with this fruit in in the pot. 
but actually yeah. what this pot is, is it's used as a spittoon. So the next picture in this article here, it shows the spittoon there at the beginning, at the bottom of their political meeting here. Who is that? I think uh, Deng Xiaoping. that's, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, yeah. yes, that's Deng Xiaoping, yeah. Hmm. Okay. It shows a spittoon at his feet where it should be. And sometimes these things are also used as uh, training toilets for children. Yes. <laughs> Anyways, I... you don't want to be putting your fruit in there, right? Because especially if you give somebody a gift in China, <laughs> yeah, you want it to be in the right packaging. Uh, it's got to be like even, even the fruit you buy from the grocery store might be um, wrapped up and packaged nicely. It might be yeah. maybe six oranges packed exactly the right way with each other and you wouldn't put them in this kind of uh <laughs> in this spittoon and give them to people you wouldn't put a nice bottle of baijiu or a nice bottle of liquor in there and i actually i have seen these when i was very young when i was in rural area because i was grew up in rural area and this one has a little um a greatness xi congratulations on it it means mm. congratulations. I see this when people are getting married. So I think my, my, my parents have one in back to the rural area, our rural home. Uh -huh. And this lasting for like 20, 30 years in there. I went okay. back to my hometown in the beginning of the year and I still saw it. And a few days ago, I saw this news. I was, what? Why? So, Cause and, and what's it used so for awkward. there? Is it is it used or is it just on the floor or what? It's just on the floor. It's just in a storage room. No one is using it now in China. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a funny little thing. Just a funny little thing. Nobody was getting too angry about this online, I think. Well, probably there are some people that are getting angry, but the general tone isn't that people are mm -hmm. angry. They just think it's funny that people uh, <laughs> in other countries are misusing their equipment for something funny. Well, that's it for today. Okay, we covered our mm. six topics in about 24 minutes. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, to anybody that's listening, I am glad to have you around. Let us know if you have some questions. You can add a YouTube comment or you can email us at newsletter at nanjingmarketinggroup.com, newsletter at n-a-n-j-i-n-g marketinggroup.com. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and see you next week. See you next week. Bye-bye.